In order to show what's happening to the farmer, let me use a $1 bill and a silver dollar. Now on the top of the $1 bill, it says Federal Reserve Note. First of all, is it federal? No. Secondly, is it reserve? No, there's no reserve on there any place. And is it really a note? Now, according to Webster's Dictionary, in order for something to be a legal note, it must have an amount on it somewhere to pay in something. Is there anywhere on that dollar bill that it says it'll pay in any amount of anything? No. Did there used to be a promise to pay on that dollar bill? Yes. What did it at one time promise to pay in? Gold or silver? Does it promise to pay in anything today? No. Then is it a legal note? No. Is it money? What is it? If it's not money. It's a green stamp, as I like to call it. Now let's take this silver dollar. And you'll remember that there was a time when you could take this one dollar bill into a bank and get one of the silver dollars. Can you today? No, it'll take approximately 15 of these to get one of these. Then what changed in purchasing power? The green stamp or the silver dollar? The silver dollar today will still purchase what it would purchase 20 years ago. What will this purchase today? Approximately 13 cents of what it would purchase 20 years ago. So what did they do to the American farmer? They loaned him money in this purchasing power. Now notice the words purchasing power. What has changed purchasing power, this or this? The silver dollar is still worth the same purchasing power today it was 20 years ago. What changed purchasing power? The farmer was loaned money at this purchasing power. You remember the price of his land? $3,000 an acre. Inflation was going wild, and the farmer was told to buy more. So they loaned him bank interest at this purchasing power. Then his land is now worth $700 an acre. What's the purchasing power now of that land? Here is its value. The farmer was at, b borrowed money at this purchasing power, was requested to pay back at this purchasing power. Can he? Total impossibility. You can't do it. Let's take an illustration of 30 years ago. A person who had $30,000. They could have bought three uh, one, uh, two bedroom, one bath houses, could they not? Today, that same individual has $30,000 in a local lending institution getting interest. How many two bedroom, one bath houses can they buy with that $30,000 today? Approximately one half of one. Then what did the power brokers of money do? They changed the purchasing power of that person's money in the lending institution. What did they do? They robbed them of approximately two thirds of its purchasing power. They've done the identical same thing to the farmer. Now we say it's the farmer's fault that he's broke. Quite to the contrary. The farmer is not at fault for being broke at all. It's the fault of the people who stole the purchasing power of the money from the farmer, loaned him at this rate, asked him to pay back at this rate, knowing all the time that they would get the farm for the price of the combine in five years. The fall of 80 then they wrote me up then for having a baby without prior approval. Me and my wife, they said it, I took the bills in in December, turned over to them, they said uh, unauthorized expenditure, you didn't get prior approval first. Then in 81, then they wrote me up in fall 81 for having a heart attack. They said I didn't, they said they could foreclose on me now because they warned me in 80 not to create an additional medical expense and I overspent. They said they'd allow me $500 medical bills. I guess some of the things farmers home would do. Well, it makes you feel fighting mad at, at the time. They had already beaten me down so much, I didn't know what to do. It makes you consider suicide or anything else. It can make you want to throw up your hands and quit. They beat me down until I felt I was second class and one worth living. They, they made me feel like I was, you know, subhuman. But this is just some of the stuff they run me through. I like to say, what they've done to me, not so bad, but to watch your family suffer, do without. And the things they've done, trying to live on what amounts to about $4,000 a year, and they tell you that's adequate. I jumped in for more money. He said, well, sign up for welfare. Are you eligible for it? I said, you want me farming 600 acres of land to go sign up for welfare? I'm supposed to be paying taxes, not spending the taxpayer's money. He said, no, you're farming for us. As we saw back in, in the Great Depression, uh, it's agriculture, really, that led the way into the Great Depression. A lot of people think it was the stock market crash, and that's what brought it all about. 
But if you get back and review it, you find that agriculture actually went into the Depression back in 26 and 27, and that drug down the rest of the economy because of the huge impact that farmers and, and agriculture in general has on the rest of the economy. So the, the danger to the rest of the economy with agriculture being in bad shape is just as great today as it was back before the Great Depression. Usury, quite a subject. Usury is exorbitant interest, this charge to people. Uh, the system wants to keep people into a usury situation. After all, it's a vicious cycle where there is no end. And once you get into it, the wealth that you're gaining by your labor is stolen. Usury is condemned in the Bible. God made it very plain that the land of Palestine was not to be involved in usury. God's people in the Old Testament were not to be involved in usury. And usury has brought about the destruction of the American farmer. Because once they get them into a usury or interest system, whereby the interest goes so high until the farmer is paying back more in interest than what they can make on their crops, then they can confiscate the farm and get it without paying one penny for it. And a good example of that was the Bedford National Bank. Uh, my wife and I heard about this, and we decided that we would go to Bedford and see if, the, if, if we could investigate the issue. And I picked this up from the newsstand in the Bedford, uh, Iowa, a little bitty country town down in southwestern Iowa. And it's the Bedford Times, and it says across the front, FDIC possesses 150 bank loans. Then it goes on to say, Army closes Bedford National Bank. Now, this story could be multiplied many times all across America. It's nothing unusual. It's happening continuously. And the story was that the FDIC came into Bedford and said, the bank is not solvent. Now, that might not necessarily be so. And in order to prove that it's not so is a person who called in on a radio talk show where I was in Dallas, Texas just a few weeks ago, and she announced that she was the wife of an agent of the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation. And her husband had just called her on the phone a few hours earlier and said that they were closing down a bank that was not broke. It was solvent and in good condition. But the FDIC had ordered it closed. And in the course of the conversation, she said that they had a schedule of bank closures from then all the way up to a few months later, and that they were closing banks that as far as he could determine by looking at the books were completely solvent. And not only that, but he said that, she said that her husband had found out since he went to work for the FDIC a year ago that they are not a federal agency, that they are a privately owned corporation. And she said this over the air to approximately three million people. So the Bedford National Bank might not necessarily have been broke. In fact, some of the people in the town told me that they knew from reliable sources that the bank was quite solvent. But what did the FDIC do? They came in, announced that the bank was insolvent closed it, then demanded payment from 150 loans. Now, the time on this is May the 7th, 1986. What time of the year does a farmer normally sell his crops? September, October, November, December? Well, it would be right uh, interesting, wouldn't it, to demand payment on 150 farms in May when the farmer has no money? But you do know in the fine print that it states that if a bank closes, goes broke and closes, that the lending institution or the guaranteeing institution, the FDIC, has a right to demand payment on those notes within X number of days if they wish. So they demanded payment of 150 notes in that area, most of which were farmers, and they couldn't pay. How are they going to pay? So what happens to the farmer? He loses his farm. Why? Because he couldn't pay a lump sum. So what happened to the area of Bedford, Iowa? Well, it's a horror story that could be multiplied all over America and was multiplied in Denver, Colorado not too long ago. And I dare to say that the majority of Americans don't know about this. I just happened to be in Denver at the time and picked this up off of the newsstand, the Denver Post, and it says, U.S. stings 156 Colorado banks. Did you know that 156 Colorado banks closed down one Friday afternoon? And many of them were not scheduled to open up on Monday morning? No. The American public didn't know that. Why not? Because for the next two weeks, 
after I was in Denver and picked this up off the newsstand, I was in three adjacent states to Colorado, and nobody knew anything about this. Why? There appeared to be a media blackout. 